Welcome to Revelation Explained Plus, a weekly video series where we will be digging deeper into the book of Revelation. Joining Pastor Gary this week is Pastor Buzz Offenbecker. Let's join them now. I, I, I think what, what I wanted to say here at this point, I, I believe, and we've seen this throughout the Bible, where God has a bottom line. You know, is, the, is there a point in this last three and a half years where the last person accepts Christ and, and believes the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or does God's mercy continue throughout this last three and a half year period? We're going to see in the rest of chapter 14 where the angels will announce, you know, they'll talk about the gospel. They'll talk about uh, Babylon being fallen. And so is this God's uh, last call for the people to respond? And is there a bottom line with God during this last three and a half years where he says, that's it? You know, um, the gospel has gone out. The last person has responded. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, my my thinking about all this is, first of all, you know, the question being, you know, when we started with, um, can someone come to salvation after receiving the mark? It, we're in a different dispensation, right? We're in a different time period. When we talk about things of church age, um, there's a certain rhythm to church age, and that's what we're in now. And I agree with you. I, I believe there will be a time when the last Gentile believer will become a believer, and that's when the church will be taken. And God's timetable is set on that. But I do believe that once you go into this time period, I believe people will be able to still appropriate grace, but it'll be a different way because the restrainer is being restrained. That's the Holy Spirit. doesn't mean He's not doing his work still with salvation, but I believe then that it will be a different, not a different way of coming to know the Lord. You still have to acknowledge Jesus Christ, but instead of looking at the cross and saying, yes, uh, thank you, Jesus. Once you're in that tribulation period, you are going to, you are facing intense persecution. I, I don't, the 144,000 are going out basically. And I believe they're almost preaching a Jonah like message of repentance judgment is a hand. And I believe the message then, because it talks about in chapter 14, it talks about the fact of this gospel that's going out. And I believe that that gospel is a gospel that's being preached on, um, let me get back to uh, 14 here. I believe that that gospel that's being preached is the gospel of judgment. Um, uh, then I saw uh, an angel, it says in verse six of chapter 14, Another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. That means everybody on earth saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the spring and the, and the, or, or the sea and the springs of water. And I believe what, he, what the angel and what's being, what's being said here, the gospel at this point is about understanding there is judgment coming. Repent. Judgment is coming. And what God is pouring out on the people should be indicative of the fact, look, you're, this world is quickly fading at this point. I mean, you've got three and a half years, three years, whatever left, and you better come to the Lord. And they're not, it's funny, isn't it? They're not preaching the idea, and I'm not saying it's not salvation by grace through belief in Christ dying on the cross and coming again. But I think that it's going more towards the idea of the judgment of God is being poured out. And do you repent? Because think of the verbiage that's being used here. Now, first of all, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell in the earth. So these are the people that are still there. And he's saying, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth. In other words, acknowledge him as the creator. Acknowledge him as the great God that who, who he is acknowledge and worship him repent of what it was that you believed before and come to the acknowledgement of christ that's that's what i see it as more than anything else you know it, it almost it almost seems like it's this is your last chance this is that yes. exactly you you summed up what i was trying to say in three minutes and five seconds that's and it. so it's interesting now is this a literal angel and it says that every nation every tribe and every language and every people will hear this angel now obviously we have the technology to be able to do that we're able to see instantly what's happening uh, around the world and so is this a literal angel is this just an announcement that's come from heaven and, and again 
this is where my imagination grows wild yeah. and, and, I, and I'm a literalist. I believe in interpreting the scripture literally. And so is this a miraculous angel now that just kind of goes flying around and every camera and every cell phone is trained onto his image and, and the message, the last message, because the next message after this is the fact that Babylon is going to fall, right? Yeah. So yeah. is this the last chance it's going to be given? Is this the last chance now that the gospel is going to be proclaimed openly? And, you know, here's your choice. You either receive the mark of Jesus Christ or you receive the mark of the beast. That's the question that I have when I when I read that, because do we find out from here on in that the gospel is being preached from here on in? I don't know. I, see, I I agree with what you're saying. I I I kind of subscribe to the same theory. Like you know, it seemed like the time period because you had 144,000 doing what they were doing, and so I believe there was people coming to know the Lord. I think a lot of it's being directed to Israel. You know, coming to know the Lord, which they will. We know by the the prophets that they will come to know the Lord. But how many people at this point on are going to do that? How many people are going to truly come to know Jesus Christ? You know. Um, you know, this whole idea of fearing God, this whole idea, you, you're really getting the idea that, that there's something to what's going on here. You know, I, I, I look, I, I think we're all in for some interesting, um, discussion when we, when we talk about these things, because I don't know, I don't know if we can fully understand we've lived in this dispensation of grace for 2000 years of, you know, since Christ going to the cross, dying, Paul saying, I preach Christ alone. I preach the, the gospel. I preach the cross. I preach Christ crucified. But in this period, it seems like they're preaching more of judgment is coming. This is your last chance. This is the final doom. And I believe part of it is God will not be challenged at the great white throne to say, you didn't give us an opportunity. Because exactly. constantly is given the opportunity. Exactly. And remember, the, the seven bold judgments haven't occurred yet. And so the wrath of God is, is going to be meted out. And so I believe, again, this just that's the stage for what God is going to be doing on the earth His judgment is going to be meted out. I mean, God's character doesn't change. He's a God of grace. He's a God of love. He's a God of mercy, but he's also a God of judgment. And so I believe here in this brief period, we see God's uh, mercy, God's grace uh, being offered now to the world, literally the whole world, as you said, possibly one last time uh, before the bulls are going to be unleashed during these last yeah. three and a half years. Uh, to get back to that question that you'd ask about redemption for the person, and I know you know this. 14.9 is where I was going. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. You know, And so, um, yeah, I, I think you're irredeemable at that point. And listen, this is where more than any other time in the entire scenario of the, the tribulation period, you're seeing the line, the, 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 the mark. Uh, the line in the sand. This is the moment Travis in the Alamo draws the line, supposedly as tradition says, and I, I don't know if it's true or not. And the, and the guys made a choice of going one side or another. Well, God just laid down the gauntlet and said, listen, you take that mark. You, because it's always equated. The mark is always equated with worshiping the beast. Mm -hmm. If you take that, you're worshiping the beast. You're done. Now, isn't it interesting? And, in, to tell you the disparity or the, the or the, the 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 change in the period of time we're living in, the the unpardonable sin is committed by what? Not accepting Christ, right? The the mm -hmm. blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not to accept yeah. Christ. Well, we can we can look there. You may have done it. I may have done it. There may have been other people before we were believers that were blaspheming the Holy Spirit when we were coming to Christ. But there was always the chance until you died. Once you died, that was it. Then, then you only way you know you blaspheme the Holy Spirit was waking up in hell, basically, right? Yeah. So, this is saying you can be alive and blaspheme God by taking the mark and worshiping. How many people have worshipped the enemy by not worshiping God, but they still can go to heaven because they repented, they changed, and mm -hmm. praise be to God for grace. But in this time period, you take that mark, worship that beast, you're done. 
I mean, people have people will have had opportunities. I mean, you have the witness of these 144,000. You have the indestructible two witnesses that are there in in Israel An angel uh, sharing the gospel. Yeah, then you have this angel, I believe, one last time. And so opportunities have been given now for three and a half years, possibly four years as we move into this last period. And so I believe this is, and you mentioned this, I believe this is the bottom line. Uh, either you accept him or at this point, if you reject him, there is no turning back. Well, let's take the few minutes we have. And I, I just want to ask you your opinion on something that gets kind of not introduced, but sort of introduced to us. Here, when in verse 8 of 14, when it's another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Um, and so we're, we're kind of introduced there because we'll get more into this in seven, chapter 17 and 18 as we go along. But what is Babylon there? What are you seeing as Babylon? Um, you know, you mentioned earlier you have a, you have the kind of, the city Babylon, you have the monetary Babylon. You, I mean, what do you see as Babylon, buddy? I think it's all of those things put together. I mean, I believe it's it's Antichrist's kingdom. Uh, it is a kingdom, obviously, that is against God. It's a kingdom that the Antichrist has desired uh, militarily, economically, socially, uh, religiously. That, I believe, is the Babylonian kingdom and all the tools that he uses to wrest the world unto himself, which is really Satan, right? Yep. who inhabits the Antichrist, and so he desires to be worshipped, and so he will use all of these tools, all of these means to, to draw the world unto himself, but his days are limited. And so he's going to take as many people with him. And and uh, one of the ways, and, and you know this in the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, temple worship, uh, pagan temple worship, a lot had to do with uh, sexual immorality. You had male and female prostitutes. And so that's a big draw. And Antichrist will do the same thing. Part of his kingdom will be, uh, again, I believe the false prophet will use uh, 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 worship uh, that uses sexual immorality to point people toward the worship of, of Satan himself. And so uh, that to me is Babylon, not so great. It's called Babylon the Great, but it's not so great compared to, to the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we have Babylon that falls. Isn't it interesting? I always I always come back to this point and I always think about like the Tower of Babel and Satan's Satan's desire has always been to, and it's kind of crazy, right? Because you would think it's the exact opposite, but he always uses the instrument of unity. It's always about the idea of this unity, you know, um, the, you know, the big movement in the, the one world ism, the elitism mm -hmm. of the world we live in today is coexist. You know, we, we all should come together, whether it's under religious banners, political banners, um, financial banners. We should all kind of coexist together. That started way back, uh, not long after man existed, and Satan starts right there. And of course, the scripture says that, that God has to come down and confuse their language because they were capable of doing anything they put their minds to, basically, talking about mankind. And now, apex. I, I've never seen such a concerted effort among not only the elitists, but also the people to believe in this idea that wrong countries should not have their own identities, you know, uh, borders are, are wicked and wrong and, and, you know, standing, standing for what makes you an individual is absolutely wrong, you know, um, and this seems to tie into this idea uh, because it, it kind of gets into the idea of Babylon again and talking about this idea of all these nations falling. They bought into, because they're drinking of the wine of her wrath of fornication, they bought into the idea of this, uh, this one world ism. Um, would you agree with that? What's your thoughts? Well, yeah, it, it sounds good on the outset, right? Everybody get together as one. Everybody love one another. I mean, all of that sounds good, but it really plays right into the hands of the Antichrist because this is what he wants. And so let's just propagate this message right now, just like propagating the importance of a vaccine and a vaccine identification card. And so unity, everybody should be one. And so the world cries out for one uh, monetary system. The world cries out for one leader to come along and just unite us all together 
together under one. And, and we know that can only happen with who? With Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the only one who can bring peace. You know, we will only be unified when Jesus Christ rules and reigns here on earth. It's, it, and, and why can't that happen? Why? Because man is basically sinful, right? And so, you know, put two or three people to put two or three Christians together in one room and see how long they agree with each other. And so yeah. now, you know, the, the there's this cry for one world unity and one world monetary system and, and the one world government. And and it just will play right into the hands of the Antichrist. And again, yeah, all of these that. all of these things are just dress rehearsals. Yeah, I tell people, I don't care what ism you believe in. Obviously, you know. Um, you're a little bit older than I am. So the idea of communism and, you know, crawling under your desks and air raids, that was a little before my time. But I remember Cold War. I remember the, the, these ideas, you know, and, and so, but whatever ism you have, communism, socialism, capitalism, whatever the ism is, um, they're all inherently evil because of man, because of what man does. I mean, the dispensations that God has allowed us to go through I think more than anything else, do exactly what you're saying, and that's expose the heart of man. It, it helps us to realize we're unable to govern ourselves. I mean, let's face it, all through the scriptures, when God says, I will be your God, you will be my people, and the people reject God, the scripture is all about God's desire to rule and to reign over his people and the, and the people rejecting him, and then having to unfortunately pay the price for rejecting God. And not always because God's zapping you with a thunder or a lightning, but because there's consequences to rejecting God's authority in your life. Bad things happen, right? So I see this kind of as the culmination. This is sort of like the reprise. We've lived our lives for thousands of years as human beings. And now in this final seven-year scenario, God is giving us a quick view, a reprise, as it were, of those thousands of years before, and this is what you've wanted all along, and I'm going to show you that this isn't, you're, you're incapable. So Babylon, to me, is just representation, as you said, of government, of religion, of monetary system. That's just, man's incapable. They're incapable. Well, at the, at the center of that whole school of thought is man. You know, and man is fallible. Man is sinful. At the at the at the forefront or at the center of Christianity is Jesus Christ. You see, we have the principles already written down for us. They don't change. Amen. They're unchangeable. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. And so that that will always work. Always yeah. work. But whenever you put man at the center of something, no matter what it is, uh, it's going to be fallible and it will have cracks in it and it will not stand. It cannot stand. We've had thousands of years of this buzzy, and isn't it, isn't it interesting? And you know that it's got to be hellish, and it's got to be the doctrine of demons. And, uh, you know, the scriptures talk about the doctrine of demons. Part of that, I think, is just this push, and they whisper in the ears of, I think, well-intentioned, many times, well-intentioned good people that, um, look, unity is the answer to this, unity. And let's face it, look, Jesus, the night, the night he was betrayed, his high priestly prayer there in the book of John was about the fact of they're unified, they're one. But he wasn't saying being one with the world. It was being one with him. Exactly. And there's a big difference being one with the world, Babylon. That's all Babylon. Mm -hmm. And one with him. And that's there, what we have to yeah. desire. There cannot be unity with man. There just is. And again, why? Because man is basically sinful. What's right for you it may not be right for me, it may not right be right for the person down the street. But Jesus doesn't change. The word of God doesn't change. It's already written down and the principles work. That's the only way you can bring unity is through the word of God, through Jesus Christ. Well, and uh, it's like I want uh, again, well-intentioned meaning people talking about coexist and we should be one with Muslims and Buddhists and all kinds of different characters. I see churches that have been started in the name of atheism. I mean, talk about an oxymoron, right? Mm -hmm. But then I stop and I think about the, the John Knoxes. When I think about the people that came before us that were burned at a cross for believing in the word of God. By the way, by religious people, they were being burned on, on poles and, and all kinds of things by in so-called name of religion. Because you and I both know that the 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 one who's behind all that doesn't want unity. He just wants to 
He wants to destroy mankind. He wants to be worshipped by it, and he wants to destroy the very thing that's worshipping him, and that's, of course, the enemy. Buzzy, our time is closing out. Do you have any closing thoughts, my friend? Uh, ju just this, the fact that we are living in a very exciting times. And I told our people, you know, I've had some pastors say, you know, you shouldn't be teaching on the word. Uh, you shouldn't be teaching on the end times. And I thought, well, what greater time to be preaching about the days in, in which we're living? Uh, and the neat thing is, is it's already written down for us. Our future is secure. Well, why not know about what my future is? And so that's where we are. So I'm excited about the. I listen. I listen to the news. I watch the news, but I'm listening to it more now in light of yeah, what yeah. Revelation and Daniel and Ezekiel and these other prophets have to say. And it's exciting to see it come to pass. It is really <clears throat> unfolding. And I tell people the same thing. And the, the way I state it is, what was being spoken of and written about not just two thousand years ago, but thousands and thousands of years ago by the prophets as they look forward to the day of the Lord, as they look forward to these things coming into fruition. First of all, to Christ coming into the world that, you know, we read about in Malachi and, and Isaiah. But then you start to read these other guys, you read Daniel and these people that, that were writing about things that they could only hope that they were able to see. You and I are given a front row. We are given better seats in this arena of watching all this unfold than Isaiah and Daniel and Malachi and anyone else and everyone else ever could even dream of. Now, we could be in fear of this and say, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen? I'm scared to death. And it's only natural to care about family and friends and everything else. But when you really stop and think about it, our next step, I believe, as a church, the true church, is the rapture. It's going home to heaven. What in the world yeah. are we afraid of? Yeah, there are no there are no prophecies that yet have to be fulfilled before the rapture happens. I've told our church, listen, I said it's it's not a time in our study here. It's not a time to pack up and to go up to the peaks of honor and wait for a Jesus Christ to return. Right. It's not a time to pack up, but it's time to wake up. That's we have a responsibility before us as a church uh, to let the world know of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One final thought, and I, and I want to share this with you, and it's interesting. I was watching uh, or listening to an interview. Val and I were on vacation. As we're driving, we're listening to a podcast, and I thought what the guy had to say was, because he's he was really laying it out. He's really, this guy is really into the intricacies of, of the government and everything else and how this fits this and this fits this. A lot of it's conjecture, and a lot of it could be taken fearfully. But what was interesting was he, he closed and he said this, and remember, these people are not our enemies, they're our mission field. So we shouldn't be scared to death of the person, you know, pushing this idea on an elitist level. We should be praying for people that they would come to know Christ. And any chance we have to share gospel with people, we, we should not make people our enemies because they don't agree with the gospel. We should look at them as the mission field um, and, and go after them and really teach, preach, share the gospel in these end times because... Who knows? Maybe that guy you're sharing with is that Gentile that's going to trigger the whole thing. You know, like exactly. they the plunk. Maybe that this is the one that causes it all to happen. But anyway, <laughs> Buzzy, please. Yeah. Well, who did Jesus hang with? Pharisees. You know, oh, I'm sorry. Jesus hung, he yeah. hung with the public. He hung with the yeah. publicans and sinners, right? Yeah, he was out there where the people were. You know, he spent some time, some quality time with his disciples, but he was out there where the people were. You know, who needed to hear his message. And so that's what we should be doing as well. If you want to learn more about this topic, you can find Pastor Gary's sermon here on YouTube. To stay up to date with our latest content, please consider subscribing. And once again, thank you to Pastor Buzz for joining us this week. We'll see you this week on YouTube or in person at Calvary Chapel, Gloucester County. God bless.